The goal of this video is to illustrate for you how we know that language is seated in the left hemisphere of the brain for about 90% of the human population. Those are typically those people who are right-handed. For people who are left-handed, language often appears in the right hemisphere. Going back to the 1940s and 50s, Dr. Wilder Penfield was an early neurosurgeon who used to perform surgeries on patients in order to correct problems like epilepsy, which was recurrent seizures. If Dr. Wilder Penfield could identify uh, areas of the brain that were um, kind of the originating epicenter, the, the genesis of the seizures, then he would be able to remove those parts from the brain and cure or strongly abate the seizures so that they didn't happen as much. But in order to be safe, Dr. Penfield had to ensure that he wasn't going to remove some really necessary, indispensable part of the brain. You could imagine, for instance, that if he took out the occipital lobe, all of a sudden people wouldn't be able to see. If he, uh, if he took out some part of the motor cortex, then somebody would be paralyzed. And if he took out part of the language processing areas of the brain, then people would be uh, incapable of producing or understanding language. Now, the way he would go about doing this is he would open up people's scalps before surgery, open up their skull, and use an electrical probe to dig around in their cortex and stimulate different parts of the brain. And when he stimulated Broca's and Wernicke's areas, he often found that, uh, that it interfered with language production or comprehension. He did find a lot of variability in the locations of these two areas, a surprising amount given uh, that this was early in our understanding of uh, functional neurology, and so uh, it was not well understood at that point that even though you might find that a particular brain region might be responsible for something in one person, that it might not be that exact same spot in another person. It might be much further towards the back of the head or much closer to the front of the head in another individual. So on average, Broca's and Wernicke's areas are where they're mapped out in the text in those images. But uh, you're going to find a lot of variability across patients. The thing that surprised Dr. Penfield, though, was that language was in the left hemisphere for about 90% of his patients. Time and time again, Broca's and Wernicke's areas were showing up only in the left hemisphere, and as he would stimulate the right hemisphere, other kinds of things would happen, but it would never interfere or rarely interfere with language. So that's one piece of evidence. Another piece of evidence comes from uh, this procedure called a colossotomy. This is, um, this is a kind of procedure where, um, again, neurosurgeons are trying to correct for uh, epilepsy or repeated seizures by stopping the spread from going across both hemispheres. If you can keep a seizure located in one half of the brain, then the effect of that seizure in the individual will be significantly reduced. So one attempt at treating uh, this, this problem looks like this. Uh, you've got two hemispheres of the brain, the left and the right. And this is, a, of course, a, a top view. This is what's called a transverse plane. And this right here is a side view. And you can see that uh, this is uh, this, this side view is actually taken exactly down the middle. So if you just imagine cutting right here, exactly down the middle of the brain, this is what you'd open up if you were to turn the brain to its side. And here, this little patch of white fiber is a connection, a bundle of neurons that connects the two hemispheres of the brain together. So this section right here is the same as this section right here. This is called the corpus callosum, and it's designed to connect the two hemispheres so that they can communicate back and forth to each other. 
But in order to stop the spread of the seizures, one procedure, as I told you, is a colossotomy where you try to um, you separate the two hemispheres of the brain. So some re uh, some neurosurgeon might come in here and they might come along and ablate or cause a lesion uh, damage the neurons. Uh, all the way down the length of the corpus callosum. So this is illustrating here, you start at the front, and you kind of just come back, and you just um, use uh, like a it, different, surgeons will use different techniques. You might use a knife or a laser or something like that to damage the neurons. And you come back here and you just are um, killing off all these connective tissues that are keeping together the two hemispheres of the brain. Now, of course, this was piloted in monkeys first, and it was surprisingly, uh, uh, it would be effective for um, treating di different kinds of things, but it didn't seem to impact the monkey's behavior or their ability to survive, live, uh, and act in ordinary ways. That was really surprising, and indeed, when it was uh, originally uh, pioneered in humans, the same thing was found, that it had very little impact on humans' day-to-day -day -day living. However, there were some interesting side effects that you could discover if you designed a very clever experience, uh, experiment and probed about those kinds of things. So here's an example. This is a, a split-brain patient here, uh, uh, illustrated, where they have had their corpus callosum severed, and... Um, they have here a, a blinder so that they can't see what's behind the uh, behind the blinder. There's just a, a series of objects, and they might reach their hand underneath. And uh, in different versions of the experiment, they'll use either their left hand or their right hand. Now you have to understand something fascinating about the brain. The right hand is connected up through and to the left hemisphere of the brain. The left hemisphere of the brain controls this right hand and receives sensory input from it. It then, if your brain is fully intact, will communicate that information over to the right hemisphere of the brain through the corpus callosum. But if that part of the brain has been severed, like it has in this patient, then the information from the right hand will go up to the left hemisphere, and then it will stay there and not be communicated to the right hemisphere. So this patient here, would be able to use his right hand to feel an object, and because that information is sent up to the left hemisphere, he would be able to say with a word what he was touching, if it was a ball or a key or a pencil or whatever it was. However, if he used his left hand, the left information would come up to the right hemisphere of the brain, and it would not transfer over to the left hemisphere, which means that the language hemisphere, the left hemisphere, of this patient's brain would not know the word for what he was touching. This patient could not communicate using words what he was touching, even though a half of his brain, the hidden secret half that doesn't have language, would actually know what he was touching, it just wouldn't be able to communicate it. So you might ask, ask this patient, well then draw a picture of what you're holding. And with his left hand, he would be able to draw a picture. But if you asked him to draw a picture with his right hand or to write a word with his right hand, he wouldn't be able to do that because his right hand has no access to the information that's held by the right hemisphere because it only knows what's in the left hemisphere. In another version of this experiment, uh, it was strictly a visual task. In order to understand that, I have to give you a little bit of an introduction to what the how, how the visual system of the brain works. We have color-coded here the left visual field as red and the right visual field as kind of a green-teal color. You can see that in each eye, both visual fields are represented. So in the left eye, the back of the eye represents on the left side the right visual field. You can see that the information right here in this triangle, this is the area of the visual field that is uh, transposed onto the back of the eye. And on the right side of the eye, the left visual field is translated. So you can see you, you've got this triangle worth of uh, stuff right here that is transposed onto the back of the right side of the eye. And 
not through the corpus callosum, but through what's called the optic chi chiasm, this information is then s sent back to either the left or the right hemisphere. The information from the left visual field, this red area, is sent back across the optic chiasm to the right primary visual cortex. This is the back of the brain where our visual information is processed. The information from the right visual field, this blue-green uh, color here, this is processed down and doesn't cross the opt optic chiasm on this eye uh, and processes back to the left hemisphere of the brain. But the opposite is true of the right eye. You can see that here the right visual field does cross the optic chiasm and uh, and the red, the left visual field, does not cross the optic chiasm and is processed in the same hemisphere of the brain. Okay, with that piece of background information, we can then say that what happens with the information from there is the primary visual cortex sends the information to other cortical regions, higher order pro processing in the brain, and you're able to connect it with words, and you're able to connect it with memories, and you're able to think about how it would the object would be manipulated or used in a real in a real life environment. That information is passed across the two hemispheres using the corpus callosum. So this right here, this optic chiasm, is not part of the corpus callosum. It's much further down in the brain than the corpus callosum. To go back one slide, or two slides, I'll show you here that the optic chiasm is actually somewhere near here in the center of the brain. So the corpus callosum is just this white part right here that ended up getting severed by the neurosurgeons. So this part of the brain was still able to cross over. Okay, so in a case of a normal individual who still has a corpus callosum intact, this is represented by the dark section between the two hemispheres of the brain, this individual could look at a screen and see a key in the left visual field. Now, if this individual was doing an experiment for um, Dr. Gazaniga, who was the primary researcher over this uh, over this field of study, um, then they would stare at a dot right here in the middle of the screen. And this picture would only be flashed for just a moment, too short for the eyes to be able to shift and fixate on it. It would just be barely registered in both eyes, but only in the left visual field. This information would go into the, the right side of both eyes because it's being processed in the opposite side of the, the, the eye as the actual field it appears in. And it would, on this side of the brain, it would be processed back to the right visual cortex. And on this side of the brain, it would be processed across the optic chiasm and pass over to the left visual cortex. However, because this key was flashed so quickly, as you can see in this image, you wouldn't actually be able to process it with your right eye. It would only be observed by your left eye because only your left eye is close enough to be able to see that flashed on the screen. So in an ordinary, normal individual, the information would be processed from the left visual field across the optic chiasm and then back across the corpus callosum. So this cross right here is not across the corpus callosum. This is going through the optic chiasm. Then here it's crossing through the corpus callosum, and then it's being sent to Broca's area, and the individual is able to identify that what they saw was a key. However, if the individual has a split brain and their corpus callosum has been severed, the information would still be passed from the left visual field, the right side of the eye, across the optic chiasm to this hemisphere of the brain. But because the corpus callosum has been severed, the information would stop right there. It couldn't cross to the right hemisphere of the brain. And the information would be stuck in this hemisphere. It would be processed by this visual field, and it would be sent to other higher order processing here. You might be able to identify conceptually what you would do with the key. You might be able to understand what your hand might do with it. Um, 
you might be able to make logical connections with, you know, a key and a doorknob or something like that. But what you would not be able to do is use a language to identify what you saw because the language center is over here. And that information is never reaching the language center of the brain. So as long as the keys only flashed momentarily, then the person is left confused, not knowing what they saw, even though the secret half, the silent half of their brain actually does know. Their verbal side, their conscious side, does not know what they saw. However, if you flash the key in the right visual field, the left side of the, of the left eye is able to see and process that information back to the left hemisphere of the brain. That, of course, stays in the left hemisphere of the brain, is sent to the language centers, and the individual is able to easily identify that the object they saw was a key. This, uh, this series of studies that Gazaniga did for decades illustrated over and over again that for most people, the language centers of the brain were indeed on the left hemisphere. And when your brain on the right hemisphere was trying to process information, trying to um, uh, identify an object they'd seen or an object they'd touched, the right hemisphere was unable to do so using language, but might be able to identify it in some other fashion, like, for instance, drawing it out.